So today we are going to talk about the uh, representation theory of uh, Poincaré group uh, to uh, to see the uh, uh, to show that or to to see that there are uh, we are in when we combine quantum mechanics with special relativity, we will get uh, we will get different particles with the spins. Uh, so we we are going to discover what kind of what kind of particles can exist in uh, in a relativistic uh, theory of quantum mechanics. So what we want to do is to combine quantum mechanics uh, with, uh, with a special relativity or combine special relativity with quantum mechanics. So what we saw was that the special relativity has a symmetry group, uh, which is Poincaré symmetry, it, is, it consists of uh, translations uh, and which we parameterize them by some constant four vector and uh, Lorentz transformation, which we, which we parameterize them by this matrix lambda mu. Mm. And so this uh, this matrix is lambda mu nu. These Lorentz transformations are form a group which is S O one three. Although I didn't say, I say, and they consist of boosts and rotations. And then in a on the other hand, when we talk about quantum mechanics, we know that we should talk about the wave function. And probabilities. Uh, we calculate. We have wave functions. We calculate inner products to get the probability ampl amplitudes, and uh, so on. Uh, okay. So here we have some wave function. So very abstract. We are just showing by side. And we know that when we have a symmetry. Uh, those symmetries can, uh, of course, those symmetry transformations change the observables. Observable, sometimes they don't change, but they affect observable quantities. So, for instance, if you have a scalar quantity, they won't change on the uh, symmetry transformation. Vectors, they change in a prescribed way. Uh, so, the symmetry transformations act on the observables in some way. Uh, and therefore, they have to act on the wave function because wave function is the thing that tells us what are the what uh, 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 what are we going what we are going to upset. And the way they act is uh, by uh, through a unitary transformation. So that they preserve the norm of the they preserve probability because we when we square psi we get the probability so these transformations have to be unitary so that they don't change the total probabilities. So we have a unitary transformation which depends on uh, this symmetry transformation and that acts on psi or. So what we say is the psi goes to u of a and lambda acting on psi. Now what do we want to do? Our goal today is to find uh, irreducible representation of this symmetry group. Now what does it mean? We want to find the minimal blocks that on the transformation they uh, go, they transform into one another. Say for instance, they, 
an example to consider, and uh, you are all familiar with, is the case of rotation. So, in, in the non-relativistic quantum mechanics, we have rotations, and uh, whenever we had uh, a problem with uh, symmetry on the rotations, with the spherical symmetry, we knew that we can find. Uh, we can write the, uh, write the expand the wave function in terms of various representations of rotation group. And those representations are characterized by a spin or angular moment, so by, by a set of quantum numbers. Uh, and how would it work? So we had a so three transformations or rotations, so there we will have rot a particular rotation matrix which is a which is an, an element of SO3 group. For a given uh, rotation matrix, we, ha we have a unitary transformation that if the parameter of this rotation is a small, it can be expanded near unity. So for zero, a rotation group was a continuous group. It had a parameter of rotation. And for very small rotations, we can expand this uh, matrix around unity in the following way. Some uh, rotation angle theta a times j a plus order theta squared times. Now what are these j a's? If uh, u is the unitary operator, this j has to be a Hermitian operator. And these emission operators are called the generators of my, uh, my group. And they satisfy some commutation relations. The commutation relations are, the, are dictated by the structure of the group. So basically, it says that if I do a rotation around x, and then followed by rotation around y, and then I do it in the opposite order. If I do first along y and then along x, the difference between the two is going to be a rotation along third axis. So that's the uh, that's just the fixed by the structure of this group. So there will be some commutation relation between uh, these uh, generators. which is called the algebra of the group. Okay, so given this, given the algebra of the uh, generators of our group, we found uh, in, in non-relativistic non quantum mechanics, we find different representations of this uh, rotation group, which are basically parameterized by two numbers, right, by J, uh, and JC, for instance, where uh, J is can be integer or half integer, and then JC goes from uh, minus J to plus J with uh, unit uh, with unit steps. Um, Okay, so then there or we, we basically, so what do we say? Every j, every fixed j corresponds to one irreducible representation. So all values of jc within one j can be uh, rotated into one another using, using various, uh, uh, various rotations. But different representations are, cannot be rotated into one another. So that's the meaning of irreducible. Uh, the, the, the units that can, uh, can be uh, related to each other or rotated into each other by the symmetry transformers. And those have a meaning. So for instance, when we talk about the spin, we say electron has a spin one half, and that comes with a spin one half. We have two positive values for z, sz, one plus one half, minus one half. And it, these two are not 
independent of each other. We cannot have only one and not the other because by rotation I can go from a spin one half to a spin minus one. Uh, yes. Uh, I have a like more maybe fundamental question about the groups. But mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about all these things, irreducible representations, they all for the SU2 algebra, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, why is the reason that we always uh, you mean instead of, instead of SO3? For or example, or any SUN or anything else? Or oh, that SU2. Uh, we look at SU2 because the, this algebra is identical for SO3 and SU2. So the, the SO3 and SO, SU2 group are different. They, they have different global structure, but the local structure near unity is identical. So when we want to label the representations, we just look at this. As well as you are concerned the, with the continuous uh, transformation near unity, you can discuss this. That's the reason, that's the main reason we talk about this, because it's the same as SO3, which is the same as rotations, uh, spatial rotations. But all this discussion, uh, let me just say, irreducible representations of SU2, which mm. is actually SO3, uh -huh. which represents the rotations and the spins. Yeah. Uh, we only classify particles according to their spins. Uh -huh. So we can just say this irreducible J equals three halves representation mm -hmm. is a particle mm -hmm. except in J, three halves. But uh, this this is the only thing we can say about the particle because we only look from the uh, spin uh, perspective uh -huh. to represent it. Yeah. Isn't it possible to uh, use another SU and uh, to have other kinds of spins or like other? Uh, Oh, well, you can imagine, uh, you, it is possible, yes, but, uh, but what is special about SU to be, do we, uh, well, because we live in a space-time which has three spatial dimensions, that's the, the, the special thing about SU2 is that it is, that it has the same algebra as SO3, and the special thing about SO3 is that we live in three-dimensional space. Now, if you have some other, you can imagine theories and people can see that. In fact, this, in a standard model, we have uh, this, we face this situation that we have internal symmetries. And once you have those internal synergies, then yes, you have to, uh, you have to, uh, label your states also by representations of those other symmetries. Yes, well, I would ask that uh, at the next step, if you consider to combine them into an SEO1, 3 uh, group, maybe we will try it, and maybe we will not, I don't know. Uh, at least in the quantum field theory uh, lecture, we would have a spinorial representation of some uh, Lorentz, of Lorentz group, uh -huh. and that included one particle and one particle, which might correspond to SU2 plus SU2. Uh -huh. In that case, we have a different uh, representation than SU2, which yeah. makes sense in physical reality, because uh -huh. we now use the Lorentz, yeah. which is bigger. Yeah. So, uh, in principle, maybe if someone uh, can make the Lorentz group or any other symmetries mm -hmm. bigger, mm -hmm. then we could have uh, different rotation generators, different groups, and different representations, right? Yeah, yeah. But in this context, if you only have, uh, if you live in the four-dimensional world, uh -huh. and we have the Lorentz uh, symmetries, then uh, J integer or half integer spin particles mm -hmm. uh, should be looked for. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, what we are going to do today is to consider this bigger Lorentz group, uh, or the even bigger Poincaré group. So this is a, this is just an example of so theory which lives inside inside the Poincaré group. But for a general SO one n, the ah. spin group should also change, and the representations should also change. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if we lived in ten dimensions, for instance, we would consider different. Symmetry, representations of a different symmetry. Uh, okay. 
So yes, yeah, so this is the goal. We want we have symmetry group. We want to find the irreducible representation, which corresponds to uh, invariant blocks, essentially. Uh, okay, so uh, so what is the first step? The first step to to find what are the generators of these transformations and what is the algebra of those generators. And now the the easiest uh, way to realize what are those is to just look at here and then by analogy we learn what they are supposed to so the generators of rotations were what they were uh, angular momentum operators so the generator is is a conserved charge associated to that symmetry we had a symmetry on the rotations along a uh, third axis, then the conserved charge associated to that would be J3. And that J3, that conserved charge, is the generator that, uh, of that symmetry. Um, now, for, for Poincaré symmetry, this is, uh, we can now easily just uh, understand what those are. Uh, we will have uh, we have translations for translations and the uh, the conserved charges associated to those translations are just moment. So now we will have translations with whose conserved charges are p mu. This is supposed to be an uppercase p mu. Uh, for momentum, and then we have the Lorentz transformations. Uh, Lorentz, with generators, uh, I call J mu nu. So in particular, if I restrict to I J uh, to the spatial components of this J, they are related to this rotation uh, generators. There will be just spatial angular momentum. Uh, in the following way that I, uh, uh, J, I, J would go into epsilon I, J, K, J, K. So we can use epsilon, fully anti-symmetric epsilon tensor to go from this two index notation into this one index notation. Nothing very uh, deep at all. Uh, okay, so we have these generators, and then we can ask what, how do they commute, or what is the commutation the relation, their algebra, and that is basically fixed by the structure of Poincaré group. So once I know, if I do a translation along duration one, and followed by a translation along duration two, and then do it in opposite way, I can figure out what is the commutation relation. I just follow this this procedure for different different elements of this uh, symmetry group. And now I get some some uh, set of commutation relations. Uh, so some of them I write. J's I won't write, but they are not that hard. So let's see. Uh, this uh, one thing that we have. Uh, so as you see, these generators, they they are they have indices or labels that correspond to the parameters 
the non the continuous parameters that your symmetry transformation or symmetry group has. So for any independent parameter, there will be one generator, right? Uh, so here we have four p mu because of four translations, three in a space and one in time. Uh, this j mu mu, uh, there is some, it has uh, some symmetry constraints on it. So if you are, uh, I think it was part of the exercises, right? This uh, Lorentz transformation are fully anti-symmetric. And therefore, this uh, J mu nu, the generators are fully anti-symmetric, so they are not totally independent. There are fewer of them than just a no, uh, an arbitrary two index tens. But this J is totally anti-symmetric, which explains this minus sign here. Uh, the structure is almost fixed by symmetry. This is essentially the only thing that you could write here up to an. Uh, a numerical factor. And then the numerical factor can be fixed by thinking about how a vector with this P mu is transformed under a rotation. Because this, if I, for instance, restrict myself to Jij, that corresponds to a rotation in the Ij plane. Say, say J12. That would correspond to the rotation in one two plane, which is a rotation along the third axis. So under that rotation, I know how these four vectors should transform. That fixes the overall coefficient here. Like P1 under the rotation along third axis, P1 uh, changes by along the second, uh, there will be a delta P2, and then uh, they will, uh, for instance, delta P or let's see, what do we want to say? For instance, there will be delta P1, which is P2 and delta or some theta 3, uh, P2, and then there will be delta P2, which is minus theta 3 P1. So if I have a small rotation along the third axis, then the change in the one component of P will be proportional, will be proportional to P2, and the change in the two component of P will be proportional to P1, and this parameter of transformation. So this fixes the coefficients here. OK, so we have some algebra for this. I think this computation relations we at first don't think about any particular uh, representation. No, this was just fixed by the symmetry group. Mm -hmm. But all we know is uh, it is enough to know that uh, J mu nu are anti symmetric and P mu is a four vector that transforms like uh, transforms covariantly under Lorentz transformations. Uh -huh. These two informations are enough to write fix this. Uh, uh, are these two enough? Well, not really. For instance, this one, but this relation is really. Uh, this is not very different from that. Like if you can hear you special to to a spatial indices. Then there will be a commutator of two rotations. Now, how do you fix the commutation of two rotations? It's not just by knowing that, by just fixing the index structure. You know that when you combine, you, you should ask yourself how, when you combine two rotations in different orders, what would happen? That fixes the coefficient. But that is something that your symmetry group the fixes. So it's not once you define a symmetry group there the, by basically by definition you should you will know what would be that commutation relation. As in the case of rotation. Now in more gen general case you could consider the in combination now of boosts and rotations and combine them together we know how to do this transformation one by one, we do small transformations in different orders and 
fix the coefficient. But the tensorial structure is more or less is completely fixed by That's just what I actually yeah. Was without knowing anything about the uh, coefficients, uh, having these kinds of generators uh, are for forcing us to write these computations. Yeah. There is no other. No, I, don't, I mean here, it, uh, for instance, that that's the only thing that you could write. This transform covariantly if you type for polar right. transformation. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, when I say this is the only thing I, I meant after the coefficient, as this. Okay. So now, what do we do? We want to. Uh, so we try to diagonalize as many generators as we can. Like here, for instance, in the case of rotations, we have three generators. We cannot, since they commute, the commutation is non-zero, we can only diagonalize one of them. And then the total J squared is commuted. So here is the same thing. We see that these P mu's commute with each other. Uh, not a surprise. Then, uh, and therefore, we can diagonalize that, which means that uh, we label our wave functions by the eigenvalue of p mu. And then this sigma will be in everything else, all other quantum numbers. So we will take our wave function to be an eigenvalue of eigenvalue of the momentum operator or the generator of translation um, now I, I hope you uh, see the difference this is supposed to be an uppercase P and this is supposed to be the, the eigenvalue a lower um, now, what is this p? That p corresponds to the that p mu corresponds to the center of mass momentum. So p mu is uh, the center of mass for momentum. It's the total for momentum of the system. Right, that's the, that's the object that uh, is the generator of an overall translation, the full form momentum of the system. Now, uh, we in particular, we are interested in the, in what we call one particle, one particle state. So if you imagine, uh, uh, I want to argue that this sigma uh, label uh, quantum numbers are going to be discrete. Now, if you imagine some two particles, then, then uh, this system will have so two particles with momentum p1, p2, then uh, there will be a total momentum pcm which is the sum of p1 mu plus p2 mu but then there will also be another uh, variable a kinematic variable of the system which is the difference of the momentum um, so it, in, what, in, in this situation uh, of course, this sigma uh, label that is left here, this, uh, this is the wave function. Of course, it should describe the full state of the system, so you should know about the relative momentum of this particle. Since the relative momentum of two free particles is some uh, continuous variable, then that sigma but that leftover quantum numbers will also contain this Q so it will also be continuous so if I want to restrict myself to one particle states 
then I postulate that this sigma, I look for the representation with this sigma uh, a discrete number. So I want to rule out this uh, situation with two particle states. Once we understand the one particle states, then we can easily put them together to construct two particles. There are this in, in perturbation theory. When there are interactions, then the situation can become more complicated. But when the interactions between different particles are weak, then we can first, and that's, that's basically the strategy that we are following. We are assuming that the interactions between particles are weak. We construct single particles and then we put them together and then treat interactions perturbative. Uh, okay, so sigma, so if I want to rule out two particles, uh, I say sigma is discrete. Now this is not actually, uh, uh, strictly speaking, this is not correct. When we see why not. But uh, I think one source of continuity in this sigma is the relative moment and that we want to rule out. Uh, okay, so we took care of momenta. Yes. You said that two system particle sigma depend on the relative momenta. Yes. But uh, what is then? What is the dependence for sigma in one particle state? What Say it again. What is the meaning of? Yeah, in one well, particle. You should think of it as the spin, some internal degree of freedom. Like imagine you have, a, okay, okay. say, electron. There will be the momentum of the electron, but it has other quantum numbers, yes, which is its spin. Also, we should include that in two particle state systems. That already was also sigma. In two yes, particle yes. State yeah. system. Also in uh, two particle state. Okay, so it's like angular momentum and spin, or no, spatial angular momentum in the space and the spin also of the particle in the space. Uh -huh. Both are in, in sigma. Yes. Yeah, if you have two particles, then yeah. Okay. Yeah, but for one particle state, yeah, you should think of this sigma as uh, it's, it's shouldn't be something unfamiliar. We have already seen uh, this kind of uh, decomposition in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. We consider the electron in non-relativistic quantum mechanics and if I have a free electron there will be uh, its wave function will be parameters by its momentum and the, and the spin of the electron. And the spin is some uh, discrete discrete uh, the quantum now. Um, okay. It could also be some other internal uh, quantum numbers. That doesn't have to be restricted to to a spin. Like for instance, you can imagine hydrogen atom. The hydrogen atom will have a center of mass momentum, but it will have inter internal levels. Those will also be this. If we write a wave function for that, then this will also be included into this. Okay. Yeah. It's not important, but you said internal, but we saw that it comes from the, the three special dimensions that we live in. Uh huh. Yes, yes. So how? Oh, uh, is it correct naming or it's um, well I so let's put it in put it in this way we want to 
if you have some extra internal there is a freedom they will also be included in seva but for the moment we don't care about those but we only consider the ones that come from the rotation so the spin for instance is one of them it's basically that but uh, if you have something like hydrogen atom it have extra extra uh, extra internal internal uh, uh, the generalities that could be included, but for the moment we don't need to uh, don't need to worry about those. So imagine that's what we call a fundamental part because so if it has no other, no more than what is required by this analysis. Uh, no more degrees of freedom or no more labels than is required by this analysis. So for the moment we only care about rotations and well, Lorentz and translation. And we have taken care of translations uh, so what we want to do is to see uh, uh, what we can do with Lorentz transformations. Uh, so imagine I act by a unitary corresponding to a Lorentz transformation on my wave function psi of p and sigma uh, so what should happen is that first of all the momentum has to go to lambda p just because the Lorentz transformation changes the four moment and then the sigma labels will change uh, so in general the result has to be a superposition of all of the states uh, with momentum lambda p and the sum over sigma prime uh, what we want to understand is that what are the as I uh, said uh, before, what are the independent blocks in this uh, matrix? So what are the collection of labels that under these transformations rotate into each other? And those we call them irreducible. Uh, so what do we do? How do we do that? If uh, if you imagine we, if we are dealing with non-relativistic uh, quantum mechanics, the task would be very easy. Uh, the reason is that in that case the boosts would be uh, would commute with each other. The Galilean boosts commute with each other. Uh, while in uh, in a special relativity uh, boosts will commute into rotations. This is something that is called Thomas uh, precision. Uh, and because of that, uh, uh, so what happens? Be uh, because of these commutations, uh, be because of this uh, non trivial commutation relation, uh, so if you very non relativistic quantum mechanics, we could basically just uh, diagonalize. Uh, diagonal of the rotation group and would get just the spin representation. So, uh, and that's basically what we do in our atheistic quantum mechanics. We first, we can go to the center of mass frame or we can just uh, label the six by momentum and then by, by the spin, which are representations of that. Uh, here, the, uh, it becomes a little bit more subtle because of this non trivial. Uh, non relativistic commutation relation. Uh, however, still, if we are talking about massive degrees of freedom, so one thing that I not, did not say is that this, under this, under Lorentz transformations, p squared is preserved, right? And this p, p squared, we call it the mass of the, the square of the mass of our, our particle. So we can, if you are in the case in which m squared is uh, larger than zero, then the situation is not too different from the non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Those extra labels are basically the speed. Uh, 
The novelty here is that we can also imagine p squared equals zero, corresponding to massless particle. In which case, you don't have any analog of center of mass frame or rest frame. So these will have rep representations that wouldn't, wouldn't, we wouldn't discover when we talk about non-relativistic quantum mechanics. But these are very similar. Uh, why don't you use the same way? I mean, it's a little bit early maybe, because what, uh, even the mass space is an eigenstate of momentum, right? Mm -hmm. And then we can separate momentum uh, and uh, other quantum numbers. Yeah. And we can go on the same analysis that we are going to do, right? Mm -hmm. But at some point they should differ. The masters one and massive yes. ones? Uh, yeah, at some point they will differ. Okay, but we are not there yet. We are not there but yet. But up to this point it's general. analysis is general. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I'm just saying that. Um, the, the final result you should uh, you shouldn't be surprised in, in this case the final result is not very surprising it's essentially that these extra representations are representations of SO3 except that you do it in the center of mass frame you go to a rest frame where the particle is at rest and there you recover whatever we did in the non-relativistic quantum mechanics, which is that, which is that the particles are characterized by their spin, uh, which are representations of a source. In this case, however, we cannot go to the central mass frame, so we find some uh, new, uh, new result, something that didn't have an analog. Okay, but they can also be treated relatively general that is uh, for now and what we do is So what we do is to uh, um, I mean this is a method for finding this irreducible uh, representation. It's called the method of induced representation. But the idea is that let's uh, pick a reference momentum k mu and so this is a fixed momentum for any fixed mass or a fixed uh, reference momentum k mu of course with the condition that k, k squared is equal to m squared or maybe zero if I'm talking about mass uh, and then uh, for any momentum p find a, a define a, a standard Lorentz transformation that take k mu to that p and that is standard transformation that prescribed transformation I call it LP so LP mu nu k nu is equal to p mu so this L is supposed to be a prescribed uh, Lorentz transformation that take me from that fixed momentum to any arbitrary moment. Uh, now we take psi of uh, p and sigma. So this is essentially the, we define it to be uh, in terms of psi of k and sigma with some normalization constant n of p and this uh, prescribed. Lorentz transformation acting on psi of k and c. This uh, procedure I look a little bit abstract, but at the end the the idea is not is very simple. For instance, in the case of massive particles, as we will see, this prescribed uh, Lorentz transformation is basically uh, or oh, this k we will choose it to be the rest frame. Uh, k in the rest frame and then 
prescribed Lorentz transformation will be a pure boost that taken from the red spring to whatever momentum that we are talking about. And if we is representing that transition. Say it again. Uh, representing that transition, tra translation. Uh huh. Let's say. Translations. Uh, I, we took care of translations because now we are talking about momentum eigenstates. Okay. But so these are just uh, these are just eigenstates of uh, momentum operator. I mean, in that formula, where where's the the rotation part? The rotation. Uh, the L nu nu is a lowest transformation. So in general, it can have a rotation in it too. But L nu nu is a particular Lorentz transformation. It's not a generic one. It's a particular one that takes k to p. So once you fix k, uh, then you can find a particular L that takes k to p. I can have an electron with specific momentum, with specific form momentum, uh -huh. and um, um, it will have the same momentum as the um, like spin one, spin minus one, spin half, spin minus half will have the same momentum. Uh -huh. Both particles will have the same momentum. So how I can go from particle with the, the same the two particles with the same momentum but different spins? How, how can I yeah, there will be there will be a rotation that takes him from one to the other. Uh, but we transformed only the momentum in, in that. that yeah, thing. here I, what I'm doing is I'm saying let's uh, define psi of p and sigma in terms of some reference psi of sigma. So, for instance, if you are interested in electron with momentum p and the spin plus one half. That would be related to psi of k and the spin plus one half. And your electron with the spin p and sigma minus one half would be related to psi of k and sigma minus one half. Now, if you want to go between these two, it's possible. For instance, in the rest frame, you do a rotation acting on this. The rotation doesn't change k mu in the rest frame, and but it takes the spin plus one half to minus one half. So the two states are related, but in here I'm just defining every part. I'm just defining psi of p and sigma by in terms of a prescribed Lorentz transformation and a fixed momentum for momentum. So this I can always do. Yes, but. What, I, what confused me is that we are describing Lorentz transformation as a transformation which just changed the form momentum, only the form momentum. Uh, no, no, no. I'm not. This is not a. This is not a most. I'm not trying to write the most general Lorentz transformation. Okay. I'm just saying that uh, in general we decided. We said that we diagonalize form momentum. So the or or Bay function is labeled by p and sigma, other quantum numbers. Now I'm saying psi of p and sigma, all of these sides of p and sigma can be all uh, defined or related to reference momentum. And then the, what, I'm trying, what I'm going to do now is exactly what you are asking. What happens if I act by a general Lorentz transformation on this side? So you want to ask, if I ask for a general Lorentz transformation in this side of p and sigma, what is going to happen? This can, this can contain a rotation, for instance. Right? Now, if I, uh, if I apply it to that formula, what do I get? I get n of p u lambda uh, u l of p psi of k and sigma. Uh, now I can uh, m manipulate this formula a little bit. So what do I do? I will write it as n of lambda p. So I divide, multiply and divide by n of lambda p. But this is nothing. This I just multiply and divide it. 
and here I put u of n of lambda p and u of l minus of lambda p. This is again nothing, these two cancel to this side. And then the rest, which is u of lambda, u of l of p, acting on psi of k and sigma. Uh, so what do the so the th let me just collect the terms in a slightly different place. It becomes n of lambda p times u of l of lambda p and then uh, these three these three Lorentz transformations I call combine them into a single transformation that I call W Oh, and then there is this extra factor. So this is multiplying n of p divided by n of lambda p times a Lorentz transformation that I call it w. Um, and w of, well, w depends on both lamb lambda and p. acting on psi of k and sigma. So what is this W? This W is just a combination of uh, these three Lorentz transformations. So it's L minus of lambda p times lambda times L of p. Now, as you can see, this is a, so what was the definition of L? L was a Lorentz transformation that takes K to P. Lambda takes P to lambda P. And L minus one, so L, again, takes L of lambda P takes K to lambda P. L minus one lambda P takes lambda P to K. So what does it mean? It means that W mu nu acting on acting on k mu is equal to k mu. So w is a Lorentz transformation that doesn't change k, this reference domain. Now, uh, this Lorentz transformation that doesn't change your reference momentum, K are called, they form a group, they form a subgroup of the general Lorentz transformations. And this subgroup is called a little group. So these doubles are belong to a, these doubles which satisfy this property uh, uh, form a group that I call them little group. With defining properties that. Uh, yeah. At the very beginning, when we said uh, u of specific uh, transformation L of p uh -huh. uh, only changes k but does not touch other quantum numbers. Well, this is in a sense my definition of psi of p and sigma. Mm -hmm. So I can, I can fix. Uh, because before I define the, the sigma variable, I haven't really, uh, I haven't really organized how to, how to, uh, how to parameterize this sigma, this other quantum number. So for the moment, I just define the state psi p sigma to be the action of a particular uh, Lorentz transformation on psi of k and sigma. Uh, does not a possible change of uh, possible reshuffling of sigma values because of the U of uh, uh, affect anything later? Or is it just correct that uh, if you just push uh, to a prescribed, prescribed momentum, uh -huh. they might not care about what happens to the other uh, quantum numbers? Well, so if you 
if you if you had a definition for this psi of p and sigma, if you had your own definition of psi of p and sigma for all momenta, then uh, in principle my transformation would change them. But since I have not uh, I have not diagonalized this sigma parameter, I'm this is uh, yeah. I'm going to construct the. Uh, I'm going to construct this, uh, uh, this uh, irreducible representation which satisfies this condition. But this condition, so uh, I mean, it's basically saying, it's basically like this when you have the rotation group, you have jz, jy, j, uh, jx, jz, jy. Uh, I can choose to diagonalize JZ, and then if I do JZ transformation, it it won't it won't change the Z component of this P. Now, if you decide to uh, label your states by JY, then if I act on them by JZ, I will change them. So but that's that, that's my choice, my way of parameterizing the. Uh, uh, this extra quantum number. So in general, any boost would change the uh, spin quantum numbers when mm. we define this, and at the end, what we uh, choose to quantize uh, according to spin mm. is not affected by this specific yeah. Uh, boost. Yeah, in fact, we construct it in, in this uh, way. Yeah. Okay. And the idea is that there is a lot of arbitrariness here, so you want to fix it in some way. So that's the way to fix that arbitrariness. You could fix it in a different way, and the different ways would not uh, then, as I said in the example of rotations, it's, it's al almost identical to the example of rotation. You want to fix this arbitrariness by choosing JZ instead of JY. Uh, okay. So we have little group that doesn't change our reference momentum, and and now we can basically find the representations of this little group. Once we find the representations of little group, then we are essentially done because if I say psi of w, sorry, u of w acting on psi k sigma is equal to some sum of the uh, sigma prime sum d tilde sigma sigma prime of psi of k and sigma prime note that k is the same on two sides because this w is an element of the little group so once, once we find that and plug it in here what we see is that we basically find these matrices D sigma sigma prime. These matrices D sigma sigma prime would be basically just uh, N of P divided by N of lambda P times this D tilde sigma sigma prime and in particular irreducible representations of the little group would correspond to irreducible representations of this Lorentz group so the set of sigma variables that rotate into each other by these little groups are the same set that will be rotated by any general Lorentz transformation so the task is reduced to uh, finding irreducible representations of the data. This N, this normalization, is there because of because of the various ways you may decide to normalize your momentum against this. So it, to be very concrete, if you decide to normalize your momentum eigenstates with a delta function, so say psi of p, psi of p prime, 
So sometimes you normalize them by by just the delta function, say two pi q delta three of p minus p prime. In that case, that n of p becomes is just uh, if I remember correctly, this n of p will be just um, just the square root of e of p. Oh, which is the zeroth component of my four moment. Well, for instance, if you normalize it by writing EP, uh, then that n of p will be 1. So that n uh, is just taking care of how you decided to normalize the uh, normalized momentum eigens. Right, because that delta 3 of p minus p prime is not invariant under Lorentz transformation, so you need some normalization factor to take care of that. But if you write Ep times delta 3 of p minus p prime, that is invariant under Lorentz transformation, so the, uh, this normalization factor will be just one. Uh, okay, so uh, the last thing that you want to do is to just uh, find the a little group and it's a reducer representation and we are done. We know what are the possi possibilities in uh, what are the possibilities uh, in this relativistic version of quantum mechanics. Uh, so now we can separate the two cases when k squared minus k squared is m squared is larger than zero. So we are talking about a massive, a massive particle. In this case, there is a natural choice for k mu is uh, to take it to be at rest, to be, to go to the rest frame. And then the little group is the subgroup of Lorentz transformation that keeps this uh, four momentum unchanged. And those are just uh, spatial rotations. In this case, our little group is just uh, SO3. And its representations, uh, not surprisingly, are just the ones that we are familiar with in the non-relativistic quantum mechanics. So these are just this Yes. We just asking what are the transformations that make uh, um, that um, transform the particle but doesn't change the momentum? Yes. And it's a sort of in, in the rest frame, right? Right, because if you are in the rest frame and you perform any boost, you will go out of the rest frame. So the, the Lorentz transformation that do not change the momentum should be just the rotations, no boost. What? What? Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, Space-time transition is not... Um, it's in, including Bulgaria or...? Uh, yes, the translations uh, act trivially because uh, we are considering momentum eigenstates, right? So special transformations don't do. They just multiply your wave function by phase. Okay. Um, okay. And then, uh, of course, one can construct these matrices. These are the things that we find in. Uh, in chapter about angular momentum in quantum mechanics. For any choice of a spin, there will be these matrices that tell us how to go between various states. And then this normalization factor, as I said, it takes care of how you normalize your momentum against it. So essentially, we are done. We know exactly how to 
transform or wave function on the Lorentz transform in this. Uh, case number two is when k square is equal to zero, when we have massless particle, uh, then uh, of course there is no rest frame. What we can do is to go uh, to choose. Uh, what can we do? We can always choose the momentum k mu to be along direction one, along x direction. And we can also do a boost in the x direction to make its frequency to be 1 in whatever unit. And then you want to ask what are the, what are the Lorentz transformations that keep this vector unchanged? So yes, some, one, of them, one of them is obvious. If I do a rotation in this two three pr plane, that will be that will be that will not change the momentum came in. So there will be J two three which corresponds uh, which corresponds to SO two. But let's first see what are the other transformations. There are two other ones. We can combine a boost. Uh, along two direction and a rotation in the one two plane so that they cancel so that would be j02 minus j12 and similarly you can also say j03 minus j13 So you can explicitly check that these are all, these uh, combinations will also preserve or reference momentum. Mean infinitesimal, and then we can exponentiate. Uh, so the, we can let's let's give some name to this. Let's call this J two series just J, this one A and this one B, and we can ask what is the what is the algebra of this generator. So these are, we have a set of generators, and they have they have some commu communication relation. That communication relation is in one to one. That that is what we call the algebra. It's in one to one correspondence to the uh, to the structure of the group little group near its identity element so we can ask about the commutation relation of these and these are of course fixed in terms of the commutation relations of the Lorentz group uh, so it will be something like that A and B commute J and A is B, J and B is minus A. And these are, these are essentially, this is R. And these are essentially the, uh, the, uh, the, these are the algebra of the symmetries of the uh, Euclidean plane. Where if we identify a and B with uh, P1 and P2 with translations uh, or maybe I should call them 2 and 3 so if I identify A and B with translation generators of the plane and J with the rotation so this will be that this will be the algebra of that group uh, the Poincaré group which is ISO And then uh, we want to find the representations of this. As, as before, we have a subgroup that is uh, commuting, uh, a subset of generators which are commuting, so we can diagonalize them. 
So we can label our psi by, so we have psi k, and then we can take a and b as the eigenvalues of a and b, and then there will be a third one, sigma, corresponding to j. However, uh, because of this commutation relation, if a or b uh, are non-zero, then uh, because we have uh, this uh, structure of the, the symmetry of a plane, if a or b is non-zero by rotations, they can uh, uh, they span a continuous range. So the Unless they are zero, they have to be continuous. So what we get is something called conti uh, continuous spin. And uh, something like that is not the, so this is the caveat to what I was saying before when I was talking about these labels being these quantum numbers being continuous versus discrete. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not really true that the only situation when they are continuous is when you have two particles. This, this is another possibility. When I, I can have continuous spin uh, particles. However, uh, we haven't, there's no indication that such, a, such representations exist in nature. In fact, it's not also obvious if you can have uh, if you can have consistent interacting theories of the, with this continuous spin. Uh, so not neither at the theoretical level nor at the experimental level there is no evidence for this. Uh, for the existence of it. So we want, we discard this as, uh, as all uh, uh, textbooks. Uh, so we said a and b equal to zero. And then we will be left with just j to three, which is, so then our little group becomes just SO2. That's the rotation. Now, if you require that under rotation by two pi, our wave function has to go change by, or by uh, under rotation by four pi, the, our wave function shouldn't change. Under two pi, it should either change to one or minus one, uh, depending on whether we are talking about fermions or bosons. Then uh, that fixes the eigenvalues of this L, uh, sorry, this J, to be integer or half integer. So, and those eigenvalues are called helicities in this context. So the way to think about them is so this, we are talking about the particle uh, moving along x direction, and we are talking about rotations in the yz plane, or the rotations aligned at x direction. Uh, so this is called helicity, the component of the angular momentum, the component of the spin uh, in the plane perpendicular to the, to the momentum. So this is called helicity. And then the requirement that under rotation by 2 pi, I change the wave function by a factor of 1 or minus 1, that fixes the helicities to be integer or half integer. So now instead of, now this is a very novel feature, right? In the case of massive particles, we would have a spin, if you had a spin one particle, then the degeneracy would be 2s plus 1, which is 3. So the values of Sz, for instance, would be 1, 0, and minus 1. While here, so this is massive. 
here we can imagine a helicity one particle like photon uh, H equals uh, so if we consider helicity one particle then the pos then we can have helicity just one and minus one in fact at the moment I haven't explained why they have to be paired in at this level they could even be just a single value of helicity if you want to require parity then parity will uh, change the sign of helicity uh, yes uh, just the moment uh, so parity parity invariance will tell you that you have to include one and one on uh, h and minus h together uh, even if you don't require parity there are some other cons uh, considerations based on uh, causality that force you to have helicity force helicity to come in pairs of positive and negative but the the difference so this is massless so this is for instance a pho photon we see that the a photon can have two uh, the there are really two photon states with the spin helicity 1 and helicity minus 1 while for a massive spin 1 particle it has 3 yes uh, for spin discussion uh, we always have uh, some SO3 rotations which have the same the algebra as SU2 and we can complexify that SU2 to find all the uh, classical spin discussion I mean. Mm -hmm. But in this case, we have SO2, and mm -hmm. to see the allowable helicity values, uh, we need to do something different than what we did with SU2, the algebra. Right? Uh -huh. And after all this, whatever that is, I don't know, this is one of the questions, uh, we end up with these allowable helicity values. Yeah, so in general, um, so in general, you would say if if there wasn't this cons uh, consideration of doing a large two pi rotation you could demand you, you would say that I just diagonalize this J2 yes. theory yes. so then my states would be uh, uh, labeled by the eigenvalue of J2 theory it's just a single generator so this eigenvalue could be anything uh, so that would mean that you have a continue that label could be anything it's not continuous because you cannot change the value of J to C, but it can. Uh, I mean, I just uh, don't uh, confuse it with discontinuous because in this case, you would have if I take A or B non zero, then by a symmetry, a Lorentz transformation, we would, uh, we would con obtain a continuum of a states. So that wouldn't be the case. So in generically you would get just psi of k and sigma so that if you apply a general general uh, transformation, little group transformation uh, what would happen? That would be let's call it u of w or let's me call it just u of j with parameter theta and that would be e to the i sigma times theta times k of sigma right so for any choice of the eigenvalue uh, of j you will get this transformation now how did I select this uh, half integer values integer or half integer values that was by requiring that if I set theta equals 4 pi, then I want uh, u of j and 4 pi acting on psi of k and sigma to be the same as psi of k and sigma. That fixes sigma to be, uh, to take uh, integer or half integer values. So uh, our knowledge of fermionic or bosonic. 
masses particles mm -hmm. into this discussion to get those heresy values from yeah. this continuous space. Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh man, because the uh, two pi rotation is is nothing. Uh, so we 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 expect that under two pi rotations, either the wave function goes to itself or goes to a minus one. But require like after two pi rotation, is the same as one pi rotation, right? Oh no! So under after two pi, it can go to one or minus one, depending on whether you are, you are talking about bosons or fermions. But after 4 pi, it has to go to itself. So that's why I said 4. Uh, we said helicity, do we always mean that with this group of the particles SO2? Um, Perhaps. Um, or is it just a law to use it with? Massless particles. This is the only context that we can define helicity. But helicity sometimes is just uh, taken to be the component of a spin along the along the momentum. Even for massive particles, it is but people define it. But it's not something. Uh, while it is Lorentz invariant in the for massless particles, for massive particles, it's not Lorentz invariant. So if you boost uh, boost an electron to very high momentum, then in that frame in which it has a very high momentum, you can think about it as having helicity one or helicity minus one. Sorry, one half or minus one. But by going to the rest frame and doing rotations is to mix with each other. Because with its sub transformation other than the subgroup SO2, uh, we can change the in those cases. Mm -hmm. well, the, because we are not talking about uh, massless particles, we kind of go to the rest frame. Well, the massless particles helicity is invariant under the proper Lorentz transformation. Uh, unless you do a parity transformation, you cannot change helicity by Lorentz transformation. What? I will relate the first then how how bosons and fermions transform to under uh, like spin. It's transform under spin to get its uh, its um, signature, right? Try to get what? To get its signature, it's transformed under spin, which is in three dimension. Uh, I'm not sure I understand. So, so, but what, maybe you should continue. So what is what are you asking? Asking about the um, uh, that we know that after that or why 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 after um, two by helicity transformation? You said fermion go to specific value and bosons go to specific values. Why this happen? Um, is, is it part of um, of SO3 transformation? So we take we take a sub a sub transformation and that sub transformation give us that 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 specific way of transforming them. Uh, is it like this? Yes. Yeah, so this is based on the this is based on the statement that if we do a two part transformation, that is identical to doing no transformation. But it's not really that because. Uh, uh, that's why we have fermions and bosons. Under two pi transformations, we know that fermions go, the wave function of fermions goes to minus itself, uh, and the wave, wave function of bosons goes to itself. Uh, so there are these two possibilities that we can have. Uh, 
or in other words, after a four pi transformation, the wave function has to go to itself. Because the four pi, uh, four pi transformation can be continuously deformed. The four pi transformation is a large transformation, mm -hmm. a large rotation. But this large rotation can be continuously deformed uh, into, into a trivial transformation. And therefore, this uh, consistency condition on the positive values of helicity is that the four pi transformation should be, give us one. Yeah. I see. But I okay okay I know that since you are explaining on half two that we split the sign after two pi transformation. Yeah. But uh, what I imagine that if we like just rotate the whole space time around an electron for example or a fermion uh -huh. with with two pi. Uh -huh. But I am seeing that I'm I'm see uh, I see that physically doesn't change anything. Uh -huh. For the electron. For the fermion. Right? Uh, so you're asking why does it go to minus? Yes. Or? Oh well I mean those uh, by mathematics, you, you can do it, but I mean, in physics, yeah, I mean, you can... Uh, well, in the, uh, so what happens is that all observers that you are talking about, they won't change under this. So even if the wave function goes to minus one, you wouldn't uh, change the value of observables. Because fermions, fermionic uh, states have to come in pair, so you, if you do this, uh, do this transformation, if you get a minus one, you square it, so the whatever observable that you have will be unchanged. But the re physical requirement is that observables should be independent on the two pi rotation. Right. But at the level of the wave function, mm -hmm. that only implies that it should change. Either, uh, either it shouldn't change, or if it changes, it should be by minus one. But then you will square it to get to uh, to get some observable quantity. Yeah. Okay. All about that is that mathematical innovations that we always are taught uh, at some point. Uh, we can have uh, spin half particles uh, coming from the SU two V algebra and to represent them. We need the, not the vectorial, but the order the representation with gamma matrices. Uh -huh. So if we explicitly calculate, then we can say that at the level of uh, spinners, the representation of the wave, wave function, uh, it's actually changing sign after a spatial 2 pi rotation, but uh -huh. not 4 pi rotation. Uh -huh. In those uh, contexts, mathematically we can show that uh, because we are allowing half spin states, uh, we can have spinners, not vectors, they transform uh, according to under a two pi rotation, uh, they pick up a minus sign. Uh -huh. What I'm saying is this result comes from that we uh, allow half spin values to exist. Mm -hmm. And at this stage, uh, now we take this uh, spinners uh, mm -hmm. because we observe them in the nature and they are realizable, take this thing to uh, justify that we have low pulse spin states in this context. Right? Yeah, I guess at, at this level what I'm doing is just uh, it's just based on group theory. I'm saying that the pulse uh, a rotation by 2 pi doesn't have to take me to 1 because this uh, group has a non-trivial global structure. But a rotation by 4 pi does have to take me to 1. So the, therefore the possibilities Second are... How can we justify that 4 pi rotation always takes us back, but not 2 pi? But because the, the group, the Lorentz group, has a non-trivial global structure, and the rotation by 2 pi cannot be continuously uh, deformed into, one, into trivial transformation, but the rotation by 4 pi can be. So we need to look for the properties of Lorentz group. Yeah. See? Yeah, this at the moment I wasn't talking about the the quantum fields and how 
you construct those uh, those spinorial fields, for instance, to, to represent the spins. That will be that will come later. Even for the uh, spinners that we know the relativists that have five spinners, this uh -huh. uh, statement still true that we rotate two pi and it pick up picks up a minus sign. Yeah. Other questions?